So I finally finished reading The Case for Christian Nationalism by Stephen Wolf. It's about a 480-page book. And uh, as I said before, I'm not the fastest reader, but I, I persevered. I worked through it. I try to be very thorough and careful in my reading of the book because I really wanted to be accurate in my understanding of what uh, Dr. Stephen Wolf was writing about in this book. By the way, if you're new to this channel and this is your first time seeing me perhaps, my name is Tim Frisch and I give a Frisch perspective. On this channel I present analysis, reviews, and fun from a Christian nerd's point of view. Love for you to join this community, so if you like this sort of Christian nerdy content, hit the subscribe button. The first thing that I, I want to say, I feel like it needs to be repeated over and over, is that different people have different conceptions of Christian nationalism. Different things come to mind when people think of Christian nationalism. And so it's really important to realize that Stephen Wolf has a different conception of Christian nationalism than a lot of other people do. He has a, he has a very different outlook and approach to the subject. And I think in some ways that really confuses the issue because some people, when I criticize this book, think that I don't want America to be influenced by Christianity, and that's not at all what I'm saying. Now, whether or not it's wise to actually use the term Christian nationalism and use that as a label, that's something that I think needs to be talked about and debated and thought about carefully. But the point is that there are a lot of people who are favorable to the general idea, whatever is in their mind, when it comes to Christian nationalism, and they see the title of this book and they assume it's a lot like what they stand for. And so something I'm really trying to help people realize is that he has a very different approach and very specific meaning of Christian nationalism that a lot of people may not suspect. And so what I really want to say in this video, this is something that struck me, is that his approach actually reminds me a lot like the approach that you see on the left today. Now, I'm not saying that Stephen Wolf actually has leftist views in and of themselves. That's not the point. I think a good way to think of it, though, is that if you think of where we're at today as normal, and you think of what people on the far left are trying to do, we would call them progressives, radical progressives. And so what they kind of want essentially is some sort of a revolution and they want to take control of things and move them in a very different direction than where we're at today. And really those are the overtones of this book. It's very progressive in a sense. It's saying we're done with the status quo, we need some sort of a, of a revolution and we need to move in a completely different direction and we need to have control of things in order to move in that direction. So I think that really aptly describes the parallel in Stephen Wolf's approach on, you know, from his perspective. Again, he's not a uh, leftist in his specific views. He's someone who uh, would be Reformed Presbyterian in his perspective. But you can see how the way that I've just described it his approach is similar to the left. And I'm going to actually read some things that he says in his book to kind of show that he openly admits what I'm saying here. He says, The pagan nationalist rejection of neutrality is correct in principle, and Christians ought to abandon their foolish commitment to neutrality, contestability, and viewpoint diversity. So he's saying there that in one sense we actually have to abandon the idea of viewpoint diversity and allowing people to express different ideas. What he's really talking about, he says later viewpoint diversity is okay, but the point he's making has to do with the parameters in which you have your discussion. And that is a lot like what you see on the left, where they talk about viewpoint diversity, but there are some things that you're not supposed to talk about or say or viewpoints that you're supposed to express. 
there are parameters they put on viewpoint diversity. And he's saying, yeah, actually that is a good thing. We just have to change the parameters. Another quote from the book shows what I'm talking about. He says, let's give the left some credit. They are acting according to good principles. So he actually says there openly that the left is acting according to good principles on some level. If one is serious about some robust conception of the good, then he should seek to exclude from the public square those he deems harmful to that good. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound a little bit like cancel culture? Absolutely, that's exactly what he's essentially advocating for, that some things should not be admissible in the public square. They should be canceled. So I think you can see clearly, and it's not just subtle. I mean, he's kind of openly coming out and saying, yeah, the left, in a sense, has it right, and we need the same thing on our side. We need to, we need to take the same approach as what you see on the progressive left. And what this is really all about if you kind of had to sum up the approach that, that he's taking here, it, it has to do with the idea of keeping a narrative in place in order to maintain peace. I think that's really what I see, the underlying conception that I see in this book, is that he has this idea that we need to keep a narrative in place in order to maintain peace. And again, that's a lot like what you see on the left. They have a certain narrative that has to be kept in place, and if anyone challenges that narrative, it will disturb the peace. I think a really graphic example of this is Twitter, and how Elon Musk, now that he has become the head of Twitter, has, um, has taken a very different approach, because the left, as far as I could tell, con completely controlled Twitter, and they had a narrative in place that they were trying to maintain and protect. And Elon Musk came in there and said, no, we need to have a greater, wider parameter on free speech. And they did not like that. So you can see, I hope you can see what I'm saying here, that Stephen Wolf in this book is actually advocating for a lot of the very same things that we see on the left. If Stephen Wolf, for example, were in charge of Twitter, there would be a lot of ideas that would not be allowed to be expressed on Twitter. Now, of course, he's not talking about Twitter. He is talking about society and creating a Christian society. So, but you get the idea. You see the point that I'm making. And a really fascinating thing is actually to see um, James Lindsay, who is an author that has written very harshly against critical theories. He wrote a, uh, he co-wrote a book on the subject and this is actually his response to Stephen Wolf. This was on Facebook. He said, meet your would-be tyrants. At 38 minutes, Wolf advocates fines or jail for atheism. Atheism is crushed. It's not going to be tolerated. And then James Lindsay says, the left needs the Constitution destroyed and the nation fractured. Meet the tools they're using to do it. Very harsh words that he is directing towards Stephen Wolf. He's, he's calling him a tool of the left to destroy the Constitution and fracture the nation. So again, this backs up what I'm saying that James Lindsay, and he's an atheist, by the way, he's a he's liberal atheist, but his view is that the progressive left is totalitarian and essentially wants to break up the country, and he sees what Stephen Wolf is doing in the, as being in the similar vein. So I think something I need to bring up here, um, because I've been very critical of this book out of the gate, from the get-go, and I think a lot of people may really misunderstand what critics of a book like this are thinking, especially critics that are Christian like myself. I think the really important point to, to realize here is that it's, it's not a question of whether we want society to be influenced by Christianity. It's a question of how do we influence society as Christians. Stephen Wolf at the end of the book talks about the time period where our nation was being formed. And he says in that section, at issue then, is not whether the arrangements of civil society ought to promote religion, 
but how it ought to promote religion. And I think that aptly describes the discussion that we are still having today. It's not a question of whether we should promote religion, but how we ought to promote religion. And what I'm saying is that Stephen Wolf takes a very aggressive and a very controlling approach to influencing the society and promoting religion within society. But ultimately, aside from all these political viewpoints and things that could be talked about, and I think they are important, my main problem with this book hasn't been the politics per se. My real main concern with this book is that I believe it takes an unscriptural approach to a lot of these matters. And I actually am working on a biblical critique of this book. It's going to be very long. And I'm going to say, just to preempt uh, anything that I put out there, that I, I know people who are very favorable to this book are probably going to look at, at a critique like mine and say, you're, you, you're not really understanding. He's not really saying what you're saying that he's saying. Um, but here's the thing. There's a lot of things in this book from a scriptural standpoint that I think are really important to talk about. And it's not just what he says that is a problem. It's actually what he doesn't say that is a problem. And the point is that, you know, if you look at Scripture and examine what he says in light of Scripture, there are a lot of real issues that we need to talk about. But also, if you look at history and you look at how his views have actually played out in history, it's not good. And I know a lot of people would say, oh, but this is different. He's taking a different approach. I don't know. When I read this book, I see a lot of repetition of the ideas that we've heard in time past, and we can see how his ideas have played out in the past, and it really hasn't been good. And also, we, we even see it in Scripture. We see that some of the, the very concepts he's really pushing for and promoting are things that Jesus himself took issue with and had to correct in his day. So stay tuned for that biblical critique. I'm doing it in writing uh, because uh, I think it'd be very hard to do it in video format, at least at this point. I don't plan to do it as a video. I'm doing a very thorough critique, but it's written. It's in written format. So if you would like to read that, let me know in the comments if you have interest in that. And I just need to figure out a way to put it online. I don't have a blog presently, uh, so I need to figure out a way to put this long document online for people to read. But for those who have been listening to me so far and they've been frustrated because I haven't been very specific, this is going to be very, very specific. Taking the different themes, quotes from the book, and examining them in light of scripture and giving my thoughts and perspective on it. And I think it's very important as Christians that we have a thorough biblical critique of a book like this because he is presenting himself as someone who's giving a Christian perspective. And I'm going to challenge that in many ways. Anyway, those are kind of my overall thoughts in reaction to the book now having read the entire thing. I would love to hear what you think in the comments section if anything that I've said in this video has been helpful or sparked some thoughts for you that you'd like to mention, let me know. Uh, or any other thoughts that you have related to this subject. Always good to read different perspectives. Just keep those comments constructive and helpful to conversation. But thank you so much for taking some time to listen to my thoughts on this subject from a fresh perspective.